Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include but are not limited to professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Viewer discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. stand, stand, stand. Welcome to Bible Bash, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask. We're your hosts, Harrison Kerrig and Pastor Tim Mullet, and today we seek to answer the age-old question, how do I become cancel-proof? Now, in order to answer this question, we'll be joined by author, writer, public speaker, and academic board member, C.R. Wiley. He's been happily married for over 30 years, has three grown children, and lives in the state of Washington. He's written for Touchstone Magazine, Modern Reformation, Sacred Architecture, The Imaginative Conservative, Front Porch Republic, National Review Online, and First Things, among others. His most recent book is In the House of Tom Bombadil. He's also the author of The Household and the War for the Cosmos, published by Canon Press in 2019. He's a board member for the Academy of Philosophy and Letters, as well as New St. Andrews College. So, Chris, we want to start off by saying welcome to the show. Welcome to Bible Bash, and thanks for coming on. Yeah, well, I'm honored to be with you guys. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I know that uh, personally I've listened to your po- uh, the podcast over the years and been uh, edified and blessed by that, and so we're excited to have you on and have a chance to talk about cancel culture. Great. Well, so, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for listening. Yes, sir. Well, maybe you could start out with just giving us a definition of cancel culture and maybe tell us why you think it's a problem. Well, I mean, cancel culture basically is a, uh, an environment, kind of a social environment in which uh, because of uh, kind of the, I guess, the, the cultural moment that we find ourselves in, you can find yourself uh, essentially cut off in a variety of ways because of something you may have said that uh, you may have said uh, by accident or you know, because you really intended to say it, uh, but because of the kind of uh, oh, strictures regarding speech and, and uh, kind of the high sensitivity that we see in lots of places, you could find yourself without a job. You could find yourself kind of uh, without a platform any longer if you if you've kind of you know had a platform on one of the social media sites, uh, or even um, you know uh, out of a job at your church. Um, th- that kind of thing. So uh, I guess that's what I mean by cancel culture. I'm not the person who coined the term. Maybe, <laughs> maybe people who've uh, you know been working with the term more would fill it out in ways that I have not thought of. But that's usually you know what comes to mind, at least for me, when I hear about cancel culture. Sure. So what? Uh, maybe you could distinguish it uh, from something like church discipline or something along those lines. Yeah, well, there's no process. <laughs> you, it's just kangaroo court, and you're just uh, suddenly cut off without any even ability to defend yourself in many cases. So I have a friend uh, who was just recently canceled at Gordon College uh, in North Shore of Boston. Great guy. We've known each other for over 30 years, and uh, he, made the, he made the mistake of actually, uh, uh, I guess, uh, promoting biblical sexual ethics <laughs> at sure. a Christian college and found himself uh, after his first address uh, disinvited. So he was supposed to be there wow. for a week 
the first address uh, led to uh, his disinvitation. And it was just simply one of these, you know, things that kind of came up from below, you know, just a bunch of uh, uh, people who, you know, took offense at some things that he said and um, made the uh, administration there uncomfortable enough for them to say, thanks, but no thanks. You, you can go now. Wow. <laughs> so, so predominantly um, in terms of trying to distinguish it from other uh you know, biblical maybe forms of cancellation or something along those lines, you would uh, primarily ground the distinction there between uh, the two in terms of some sort of due process or some sort of um, not bowing down to the uh, court of public pressure, that kind of thing? Yeah, it's the difference between the mob and the court. Now, sure. court, you can you can be condemned in a court and you can be disciplined, but also with regard to uh, the church courts anyway, the purpose is restoration. Whereas, uh, you know, public cancel culture, it's obliteration. It's just, they just want you to go away and never come back, have nothing uh, to, to do anymore in the spheres that they, uh, they, you know, sort of cast you out of. So part of the reason then why it would be a problem uh, would be that it has no redemptive purpose behind it. It just is an exercise in raw uh, punishment, justice, uh, punishment or destruction where you're just trying to essentially destroy a person. For, yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then when we're talking about standards of justice, and, and you know, what are we referring to? So I made a, a uh, you know, a, a uh, an observation about what occurred at Gordon College. So right. Gordon College is a school that uh, is um, self uh, consciously and uh, identifies itself as a Christian institution, an evangelical uh, college in the Christian College Coalition. And as far as I can tell, the, you know, the standards of the school uh, in terms of biblical sexual ethics have been unaltered. So there's nothing that uh, Marvin uh, said, and my friend's name is Marvin Daniels, nothing that Marvin said that would be out of keeping with those standards, yet he found himself disinvited. Wow. So fundamentally, cancel culture is uh, imposing upon us an alien standard, essentially, a standard that's uh, coming from the outside uh, as to just uh, keeping the pagans happy, something along those lines. Yeah, I think that that's correct. I mean, there's a kind of um, interest in, well, you often hear uh, this apologized for in terms of, um, you know, tone. We don't want people to, you know, uh, have their feelings hurt or, or uh, think that we're uh, speaking strictly from some kind of uh, uh, vitriolic uh, and uh, narrow-minded uh, outlook. So, you know, that, that's usually the way, at least within Christian circles or maybe in even uh, academic circles that are uh, self, I guess, uh, you know, self-proclaimed, you know, bastions of liberal thought. Uh, or th- liberal kind of standards. Uh, and then uh, little is done in terms of actually trying to explore the basis of the accusations, whether they're founded, whether they're justified or not. Um, there have been just a lot of, fo- a lot of examples, a lot of, a lot of, you know, situations that we could point to and say, this was just sort of a, a lynch mob, a virtual lynch mob. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, um, People were punished um, for things that they should not have been punished for. They weren't even wrong. <laughs> Just sure. a lot of people uh, took offense. And so consequently, we've got a situation in which uh, the offense is giving offense. That's the offense. It's not whether or not the, you know what was said was right or wrong. There really are uh, situations in which giving, an offense, giving offense is the right thing to do. So... It, it does seem like we're living in a time right now where um, essentially right and wrong are determined by how people emotionally respond to that information uh, more, uh, you know, over and against just uh, typically what we would understand uh, right and wrong to be defined as to their correlation to reality, uh, right. essentially. And so right. now, yep. Yeah, that's now, right. Now, before we started the show, uh, Chris, you mentioned that you were excited to talk about this topic because it's something that uh, you think about a lot yourself. And so, um, I guess I would just ask you, you know, what, what caused you to, you know, really think so much about, 
uh, cancel culture to begin with? Well, I suppose it's because I could see it coming, uh, you know, years ago. Um, I lived, uh, you know, in Cambridge, Massachusetts for about a decade, right between Harvard and MIT. And I was, I spent some time at Harvard. And uh, so I was involved in it, or I was kind of, kind of in, 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 in sort of situated in a milieu in which many of the, I guess, uh, many of the trends that we see that have come to fruition and have spread throughout popular culture and uh, acad- not just academia, but, you know, entertainment and, and beyond. Uh, I could see them in uh, an early uh, embryonic stage, and I, I didn't take a lot of work to extrapolate to kind of imagine where things would go. I did, I did think that uh, much of the evangelical world was vulnerable to kind of what we now call wokeism. Mm -hmm. Um, And I uh, consequently uh, began to structure my own life to become cancel proof. (laughs) And uh, so uh, I'm far enough along in that now that I'm fairly cancel proof. And um, so I'm happy to talk about how I, how I went about that, but, but that's the reason why, because I could see it coming. And, um, and I, and I, and I felt like, uh, you know, the first place to, uh, to begin in terms of thinking this out is how do, how do I, as an individual who at that time had, you know, small children, um, how do I, uh, you know, sort of set myself up so that I'm not going to, uh, well, uh, find myself in a situation where I'm not able to take care of my family the way I'd like. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, you know, being someone who has a, has a pretty big platform overall, I'm sure you get a lot of people who are, uh, you know, pretty angry about some of the things you say. I remember, I don't, I don't remember when I saw the video, but I watched your, um, your, I guess, I guess the lecture you gave, I think it was, you know, when, when the same night Doug, Wilson gave his, um, uh, I think sexual by design, um, speech yeah, the same I, night. Well, actually they were different, different Oh, were events. they different? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, uh, came same hostility. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm sure you face, I'm sure you face stuff like that pretty often. Sure. So, um, you know, do you, so could you just kind of, you know, spell out one of those experiences where you, you've had people kind of coming after you for some of the things that you believe and, and that you've, you've said before? Sure. I mean, I've, I've written things that have gone viral and uh, I've gotten hate mail from around the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. <sighs> so, so, you know, I could say that I'm, I'm uh, infamous uh, in <laughs> the minds of some people. Um, Notorious uh, Sierra Wally. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I try to, I try to, Help, I try to convince people that I'm a really nice guy, but you know, some people just don't <laughs> want to accept that. But um, yeah, so you know, I've had those kinds of those, those kinds of experiences. In fact, you know, my it was interesting that my uh, my years in Cambridge were very helpful in this regard. Um, I was in an environment where initially, just kind of give you a little bit of background on me. I was involved in what could be described as a kind of uh, earlier wokeism, it was mostly oriented toward kind of economic issues and uh, things related to ethnic uh, relationships uh, between groups and and race relations and so forth. So I was uh, I was kind of on the cool side of the table at once one time. You know, people <laughs> I traveled the country and spoke about all those kinds of things. My friend Marvin Daniels uh, that I just told you about who was canceled at Gordon College is is black, and uh, we actually were involved in urban ministry for about a decade together. So, um, and he's from, you know, uh, New York city and worked in some of the toughest neighborhoods in Chicago. I mean, so when it comes to, um, you know, his pedigree and my background, we, we've had plenty of, uh, I guess, exposure and I should focus more on myself, plenty of exposure to, uh, the out you know, sort of the mindsets that, uh, we're dealing with here. Um, when I went to Harvard initially, there's a kind of an, a fun story behind that, and it has to do with what we're talking about. So I had a, a friend who was the chairman of the Republican City Committee for the city of Cambridge. Uh, he actually went on to work in the uh, Bush and Obama administrations in trade. Uh, but at that time, he was there in, in Cambridge, and uh, he, got a, he got a call from Harvey Cox. 
that name probably doesn't mean anything to you, but he was a big deal back in the 60s and 70s, kind of death of God, theology, stuff like that. He wrote a book called Secular City that sold like two million copies. Anyway, he was a big deal at Harvard Divinity, kind of public intellectual, you know, got into New York Times and the Atlantic all the time. Anyway, so he's having he has this class on kind of evangelicalism for students at you know Harvard Divinity to kind of like, you know, learn about those strange creatures, you know, yeah, conservative <laughs> Christians. <laughs> and so uh, he called my friend uh, uh, David Trumbull and, and David said, well, I'm a, I'm an Anglican. I don't fit the, the, you know, the bill, but I, I know some guys. And so he called me. And so I went into this classroom environment uh, where, you know, there was, there were three of us and there were 30 of them. And we, and, and we just kind of had it out for like an hour and a half. It was just like complete, uh, kind of free for all kind of bar brawl. And, uh, Harvey Cox was overseeing it kind of like the referee. He's a cool guy. He's still alive. But, uh, afterward he actually asked me, he said, Hey, Hey, I'd like you to come to Harvard divinity. And, uh, so that's how I ended up there. He, he became my sponsor, mm -hmm. but, uh, every, every class was like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, the, the situation I faced at, at, you know, uh, University of Idaho, they were really junior league. I mean, they were like the junior varsity of the liberal world. I mean, they were, they were actually kind of laughable in, in terms of just, they had, they had really had nothing, uh, that, uh, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've got, I fought their big brother, you know, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was, it was kind of amusing for me. I was kind of, in, I was just enjoying the experience. Uh, and I, and I have plenty of police protection. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps. I, yeah i didn't have how anything. many death threats do you get a, get a year <laughs> well you know one of the things this this kind of gets back to can't you know how do you become cancel proof i really do think that there are certain uh ways that you can like make yourself more vulnerable and you can kind of work at trying to make sure that those those means by which people can get at you are removed or at least uh hard to find and uh so I used to get more than I do now. And it's because I've kind of systematically figured out, okay, these are the things that I can do to make sure that I don't get, you know, you know, sort of uh, hate mail in the middle of the night, wake me up at two in the morning, that kind of thing. Fair enough. Well, one of the questions I wanted to uh, get to before we maybe dive right into the, uh, the method that you're withholding from us, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think there is a sense in which there's obviously nothing new under the sun, uh, and maybe that applies to cancel culture to some degree. I mean, in some sense, I, I think cancel culture may, might be as uh, old as Cain with his rock, Yeah, uh, as far as yeah. that's concerned. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, the Apostle Paul had a lot of cancellation issues. You know, yeah, he did. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> same in witch trials. I mean, there's uh, right. been plenty of, I think, historical examples of, of this kind of phenomenon. But, you know, what, what do you make uh, of the current trend towards cancel culture and how do you distinguish it from historical manifestations? It seems like there, there's something a little bit different going on today than uh, maybe yeah. before, but maybe that reflects a historical naivety on my part. But what do you think? No, I, I do think, you know, technology it plays a big role. Um, sure. Things can happen really fast. And um, because everything is kind of funneled through uh, the internet now, uh, there are these choke points with regard to even your financial, um, you know, means to, to make a living or to even conduct business. So, you know, businesses can be dis deplatformed. They, that happens, uh, debanked, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think that that, that technological, uh, aspect of the, of the situation does distinguish it. It also gives it a more, I guess, uh, sanitary sort of ca character. So like when the Apostle Paul was canceled, they actually had to pick up stones, get their hands dirty right. and, and try to harm him physically. Right. You know, and that can do something to, you know, your conscience. You might feel a little bad when you see some blood, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, whereas this is kind of a bloodless, depersonalized uh, kind of. Uh, Even virtual, anonymous at times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Virtual experience and, and anonymous. So people is. And so I guess we figured out a way to do this humanely. You know, nobody's dying in the street. You just cut off their means of livelihood and you let them try to figure out how to take care of themselves after that. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, well, how would you uh, rate it? You know, as a historical problem as it relates to that. I mean, in terms of 
there there are some things that distinguish it, the technology aspect of it. Um, I think, um, you know, the fact that there's so many people now who can basically um, have access to that information yeah. too. Right. The ease of spread of information. But yeah, I think, yeah, I think those things are, are you know, are, are certainly unique to our time. Um, I do think that, you know, we can't, we, we shouldn't over sort of like uh, state the problem in the sense that, you know, Christians in the Soviet Union had it a lot work harder than, than we have it. Um, and so there's not much uh, basis for comparison in terms of hardship. You know, I'm not consent to the gulag, you know. Sure. Uh, but um, in terms of, uh, you know, being sort of, so, sort of aware that at any moment something could be thrown at you, that, that I do think is um, kind of, kind of uh, new. Uh, in the, you know, for example, here I am speaking to you on a computer. Uh, I've got my cell phone or my smartphone. So the means you know, of, of kind of access to me and my means of access to kind of this larger world instantaneous, you know, speed of light, um, that's different. Isn't it sort of weird that, I mean, um, you, you know, you could have said something 15, 20 years ago and it could be resurrected today through technology oh, yeah. in a way that, uh, they wouldn't have that same kind of access to information in different times in history yeah, to yeah. be able to do that. Uh, I've had it happen to me. I've had it happen to me. And I've been in situations where people are bringing up stuff from, from years ago and I'm like, what did I say? Uh, <laughs> you know, I've said a lot of things, you know, can you give me a little context here? Where, where'd you find this? You know, that sure. kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so anyway, yeah, that, that's very true. So I guess the follow-up would be, you know, how do you, how did we get here to where we are at this point where, um, essentially you say one thing that someone doesn't like, and you're at a place where, you know, you lose your job, you lose your livelihood, go bankrupt, get sued. Right. How, how do we get here? What are what are some of the factors that have led to this kind of moment for us? Well, I think uh, there have been trends in uh, pol- you know political life and also uh, uh, academic uh, sort of uh, thought that have uh, coalesced uh, with the technology that we now possess. So these things have kind of come together in such a way to create a kind of perfect storm for this. So you know, if we think about kind of the leftward, uh, the kind of strong egalitarian kind of undercurrent that we see in the modern world that uh, has kind of uh, spread throughout society and kind of leveled many things, uh, including our ability to make legitimate distinctions between just, you know, even biological realities, like men and women are different. <laughs> this, right. this stuff. Uh you know, it goes back a long way, at, at least to the French Revolution. Uh, but I, I think that there are antecedents even to that. And uh, it's been kind of working its way through the uh, West for some time now. So, you know, things like uh, what we saw in the 1960s with, you know, a, a lot of uh, what occurred on, with the rise of the new left, uh, the, People, you know, who've been influenced by the Frankfurt School, people who've been influenced in more, more recently by uh, developments and, liter- you know, sort of literary interpretation with Foucault and Derrida and so forth. All this stuff is kind of working its way out uh, to kind of the ground level. I mean, I, I remember back in the, in the 90s, I would talk about intellectual sort of trends and how I, I thought they would be uh, uh, eventually... Um, sort of felt in just, you know, popular culture and in just everyday work environments. And people just thought I was nuts. People right. thought that I was overstating the case or I was, uh, you know, an alarmist or something like that. And I, I'm afraid that I was right. <laughs> Everything that I said was going to happen has happened. And uh, so I, I can go back and look at stuff that I was writing in my own, my journal back in like 1995. And I can say, yep, yep, yep. They, all those things happened. So, so uh, par- partly you're uh, mentioning critical theory and then uh, postmodernism, the absence of any kind of objective notion of truth. And then so you mix those two things together and then kind of the egalitarian impulse, you're putting that in there as well. Right, right. Combine that with the technology and, you know, we're in a situation where uh, 
feelings matter more than facts, essentially? Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, many people live very uh, kind of cosseted, buffered lives, you know, because uh, they don't actually have to deal uh, directly with the physical world. I think that's another thing to kind of consider in all this. There are certain professions that are much more kind of susceptible to the wokeism that we see around us than others. Um, they're, they're, as far like as I guess, math is not, math and science aren't, but then when you're in the realm of literature, is that, is that what you mean? Well, you do see there, but uh, math and science are starting to feel the pressure now in the way that sure. no one anticipated they would. There are a lot of crazy things going on in those environments that a lot of, a lot of people that I, uh, Math is racist and two plus two equals five kind of stuff. Yeah, almost that bad. And um, but I was thinking more than just in terms of, you know, you know, guys who work with their hands, they either right. can do the job or they can't. You know, as I'm driving down the street and I'm looking at all the guys who are working on like uh, the, a lot of the large construction projects, you know, in very liberal places like Portland and Seattle, they're all guys. <laughs> You know, they're isn't, all guys. <laughs> isn't that amazing how that works, that feminism doesn't want to advocate for equality on the uh, construction jobs, but only in the CEO kind of jobs? Well, actually, they try, but they fail. You see, right. this, is, this is like the story that no one wants to, to kind of get into. There, have been, there has been a push for at least 30 years, because I can remember it, to get more girls into the trades. Right. And they just simply wash out because it's too physically demanding. And the work has got to be done. I mean, this is not about making you feel good. In fact, one of the things that you see in sort of, you know, I, I have a background in the trades and I've uh, been a contractor. One of the things you see is you, you got to make money and you are in a competitive environment. And if you're not f fast enough or competent enough, we, we just can't wait around for you. You know, so why don't you just go hold a sign on the side of the road that says, you know, stop and uh, drive slow. And that's where you see a lot of a lot of the ladies event, you know, end up is doing that kind of stuff uh, if they have any any kind of, uh, you know, direct experience with the trades. Or sometimes you'll get some, uh, say, you know, home improvement company that's you know founded by a bunch of lesbians. And they uh, unless they, they, they've got like this strong community of lesbians and feminists who keep them busy, they're out of business before you know it. It's a tough way to make a living. And there's a lot of physical, there's a lot of physically demanding aspects to it. You know, just picking up a worm drive uh, saw uh, is too much for, for most uh, people outside of the trades. Uh, yeah, that kind of reminds me of, you know, when I first got out of seminary, I did an appliance delivery job uh, for a little bit. And, you know, we were working from, you know, four in the morning to seven at night and delivering 600 pound refrigerators and, and all that kind of stuff. But, um, there's some ladies who worked that job with us, but, you know, they <laughs> largely, you you know, as a guy in that kind of job, you know, if you had a lady that was you're supposed to help you, you knew that you were doing you're taking that refrigerator in there by yourself, essentially. Well, and often what they'll have is uh, the foot, the, there are kind of these awkward moments where the uh, the the weakness of the of the of the gentle sex or the fair sex is un avoidable. We can't, we can't right. pretend that this is not true. This refrigerator is on a landing two flights up and it needs to right. go up three more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so either get out of the way gal or, right. uh, you know, help. And if you can't help, then why did you ask for this job? Right. That kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. A big part of uh cancel culture is obviously the idea that whenever the, the mob, you know, the, the general group of people uh, don't agree with something. They typically just want to uh, take whatever dissenting voices uh, are there and just totally remove them by whatever means are uh, available to them. <clears throat> and certainly for Christians, there's plenty of, of views and takes in the world that I think any person who reads their Bible uh, and, and believes that it's true and, and wants to commit their lives to following what God has said is righteous. There's plenty of things uh, that the world believes that we would look at and say, hey, I really wish that this idea would go away. I really wish that uh, anyone who's pushing for abortion would just totally stop you know, uh, advocating for it. And so there's a sense in which I'm sure there are plenty of Christians who uh, might be tempted to say, um, Man, I really, I really want to cancel this person who keeps pushing for homosexuality, who keeps 
pushing for abortion, you know, um, what, whatever it is. So Chris, do you think that there's ever an appropriate time for the Christian to, uh, partake themselves in cancel culture when it comes to talking about unbiblical views? Yeah, I think, I think there is. I mean, um, what we were referring to earlier as uh, church discipline, um, when civil law has been informed by scripture, then the civil authorities uh, find themselves in situations where they're uh, enforcing uh, a set of uh, laws that has some kind of Christian input in Mm -hmm. their development. So in a situation like that, um, uh, Christians who are, you know, thinking as Christians and uh, involved in sort of the political and legal process and doing so self-consciously as Christians are, are looking to uh, secure the public good, uh, enforce justice, these things. It's not necessarily about whether or not something that was said hurt your feelings. You know, like, like, for example, just a few moments ago, I said, some, I said some things about the differences between men and women that some people today would find deeply offensive. Uh, but that doesn't matter. They're just real. And I'm not going to pretend that they're not. Uh, now, they, they might try to craft laws to make it illegal for me to, to say things like that. Um, and, you know, they would have some kind of uh, philosophical and uh, kind of political uh, outlook that's informing their approach to matters related to law and justice and so forth. And so they're pursuing that vision. I simply disagree, and uh, I would, I would uh, uh, argue uh, that, that, that their understanding of justice is incorrect, um, and that you know, uh, an understanding of justice that's informed by the natural law and by scripture is uh, what we ought to be looking to if we want to order society in ways I described. In other words, securing the public good and, and uh, securing justice. But uh, I guess that gets at what you're saying uh, here, uh, Harrison, and that is, um, I think there's a, sometimes there's an assumption uh, that people have that if uh, there are matters that I believe to be true because I'm a Christian, that means I can't call for their recognition in the public square. Uh, and, and there's kind of a self-censorship that sometimes goes on mm-hmm. because it, it, it seems like we're just kind of foisting our views on other people. The Christian faith is not based on our personal predilections or, you know, desires. The Christian faith is based on objective realities. And so because those realities are simply true, uh, the Christian faith uh, should be presented as public truth. And so my argument would be that um, if we don't uh, present the Christian faith as public truth, then in some sense we're implying that it's not true for you. It's just true for me. So it's, it's not about what uh, morale. It's not about whether we're going to impose a certain morality on our country. It's what morality are we going to going to impose? Essentially, yeah, not whether or not, but which. That's the which, thing yep. that yeah that I think is is absolutely right. So uh, there's no neutral uh, ground to kind of retreat to where we all can be play you know play play it safe and be nice. Uh, I think that we need to be civil with the people that we disagree with. But I don't think that, uh, I think that the days of self-censorship are over. And I think we just need to get used to uh, a uh, future for the foreseeable future in which uh, we need to, uh, we're called to uh, present our convictions as public truth. And you said uh, that obviously one of the, one thing we do need to do is, is we need to be civil in our disagreement and, and our pushing for, uh, uh, you know, righteousness, um, in our, in our nation. I'm assuming when you say that you mean that as, uh, we shouldn't be, uh, as, I guess, essentially going after individuals who would disagree with us in the same way that it seems like, you know, the cancel culture mob typically does today. Right. Yeah, I think that Peter is pretty clear, you know, be prepared to make a defense for the, the hope that lies within you, but do so with res- with respect. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we do it with respect is because of our convictions. 
that uh, human beings are made in the image of God. So it's not just that we're trying to be nice. So we're, we're trying to win friends and influence people in a kind of Dale Carnegie way. Uh, we're not being manipulative. It's just simply we're recognizing some facts, some realities. And one of those realities is that the people that we disagree with uh, are made in the image of God. And we need to, uh, even as we 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 disagree with them strongly and argue vigorously, uh, recognize those realities and and limit ourselves in terms of what we mm -hmm. resort to. Okay. All right. One more question before we get to the title question, uh, Chris. Uh, I mean, the right essentially believes that cancel culture is uh, largely a problem of the left, and then the left will in turn look at the right and essentially say, you know, you guys are being hypocrites. You you cancel just as much as we do. Uh, wh where would you fall on that kind of argument? Um, well, I think we got at it a little bit uh, already, and that is uh, if we have standards, then they are going to be uh, applied. And then the question just has to do with uh, are we going about it in a in a just way? Are we due process yeah those that kind of stuff and are the things that we're trying to enforce uh things that ought to be enforced so i do think that there is a kind of uh range of of matters in which uh we just kind of have to accept that uh you know uh short of the perusia <laughs> we kind of kind of have to live with uh, with uh people who disagree with us in a range of things and uh, then the question is, is, you know, what, what goes in those categories, uh, you know, or, or that sort of that area in which we're unlikely to get, um, any kind of, uh, useful, uh, a, a set of standards applied. So an example would be say prohibition. So I'm sitting here enjoying a beer right now as I'm talking with you guys, but there are a lot of Christians out there who think that that's, that's a problem. And uh, there's a range of uh, opinions about the status of alcohol, even in the church. So, um, you know, that would, that would be something that I would categorize as uh, a matter that we're going to have to have uh, generous, dis, you know, sort of generous uh, uh, regard for the people who disagree with us about. Sure. So would you say then that uh, cancellation that the left is engaging in is largely based on just the standard of, you know, hurt feelings, essentially, and then what the right should be based on is more uh, matters of, you know, ob objective truth with some sort of tolerance for um, dis disagreements at, at those levels? Yeah, I think on the left, what's what we're seeing today is can be described the way you just you just described Tim. Tim. But I also think that there's a, a pretty significant difference between um, groups of people in our society about the nature of language and how it's it's uh, used. So uh, if a person has come under the influence of, say, you know, critical theory, then language is just another tool or weapon to kind of get your way in the world. It's not necessarily a means by which we convey the truth or, or, or sort of reflect reality. It's it's just sort of a, an extension of a particular group's interests. So if a person maybe feels like, you know, something that you've said uh, uh, is uh, in some way harming their interest, uh, right. you know, then um, uh, those things should not ever be permitted to be said. Whereas uh, a more, uh, I think, traditional understanding of language is that um, language it has a capacity to, to uh, express uh, realities that are that are true and not just simply the interests of any particular group sure well you've been kind of we've kind been kind of beating around the bush with this uh you know cancel proof hey you, you've right. spent years you know crafting your life in a way that uh you've sort you've sort of protected yourself um, from all of the death threats. So now you actually get less of them. So, so it seems like whatever you're doing is, is working in some capacity. So, uh, could you go ahead and, and explain to us what you meant earlier when you're talking about, Hey, I, I've crafted my life. I've sort of, um, you know, set up my life in the specific way that has allowed me to become cancel proof. Yeah. I think that what I've done could be described, uh, as, um, bringing sort of the, uh, the, the, the things that I need to control uh, closer to me, in, a, in other words, so that I can uh, have uh, 
greater, I guess, uh, um, autonomy and agency. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, when I had a sense that I was going to find myself uh, kind of outside the mainstream when it came to certain convictions that I had, I realized that um, I needed to have a greater measure of control over my income and my wealth, uh, particularly since I had you know small children uh, to provide for. My wife was uh, you know a mom who was uh, homeschooling the kids, and and so I, I got involved in uh, investment real estate. And over the years, I built a portfolio that allowed me to have this kind of uh, uh, set of uh, assets that. Uh, Kind of ensured my uh, my livelihood in case my other means of livelihood suddenly evaporated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey. So that was that was a pretty important thing. Um, later on, uh, when I got into you know uh, kind of the world of of uh, you know publishing for you know wide range of public you know publications and was uh, you know sort of uh, exposed in, in those ways, I. Uh, I, I made sure that, you know, I had um, a set of alliances or connections with uh, publications that were uh, sympathetic to the kind of the core concerns I have. So let's say, uh, you know, the things that I write for, say, Canon Press or for Touchstone Magazine were published in uh, the New York Times. I'd probably lose my job mm -hmm. <laughs> at the New York Times, you know. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's a thing. Now, those, those uh, publications that I write for, they don't have the kind of the, obviously the reach uh, or the, um, the status of the New York Times, um, but they are uh, places where, you know, the things that I want to write about are the things they want to publish. Uh, a, a third area in which uh, I've gotten, you know, greater degree of control is uh, making certain that when I'm serving an institution, including the church I serve, I'm, I'm uh, working with people who have a high degree of conflict tolerance. Not, they're, they're not conflict avoidance people, but they're people who are actually capable of dealing with uh, host, you know, sort of hostile um, parties. So the mm -hmm. church I serve right now uh, is definitely that way. And it had a lot to do with why I'm here. Uh, I've served other churches that have great people, um, but they weren't uh, people who um, were capable of dealing with that kind of negative. So for, let me give you an example. So I went on Cape Cod. I, I pastored a church on Cape Cod back in the days when there was just a lot of talk about, you know, gay marriage. This is before the, you know, Supreme Court decision, you know, of a few years back. So this was still a matter of, of um, live, uh, you know, controversy and debate. And I wrote, uh, a letter to the Cape Cod Times defending traditional marriage and calling into question the legitimacy of something, you know, like gay marriage. And it led to a hate mail campaign that went on for a month at the Cape Cod Times. Every, every day there were letters attacking me in the Cape Cod Times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember going to my church board and saying, you know, are you guys ready for what this could mean? are you ready for maybe a picket line outside church on Sunday morning? And I could see their eyes pop wide open. <laughs> they were scared to death. <laughs> I said, you know, uh, I, I get it. You know, you, you guys, uh, you know, your idea of making a risky decision is maybe moving to a new house. And, uh, you know, you just not, it's, you just, it's just sort of this, this kind of thing is just so far beyond the realm of your, um, ability to imagine or sort of reconcile yourself to that it's just unrealistic for me to accept or to believe that you could kind of step up to that. So um, I think that if you're, particularly if you're a pastor, you, you need to be, uh, you know, you know, situated in a, in a, in a leadership environment in which um, conflict is not, it's not sort of like the, the ultimate problem or the thing that needs to be avoided at all costs. You need to have a, a measure of comfort uh, with it. And so that was important for me as well. I didn't want to find myself someday, um, you know, uh, defending myself to my own session or my own board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you say, would you say, oh, 
Go ahead, Harrison. You got. You have some well, I was just, I was just going to ask. I, I'm assuming that means if if you need to situate yourself in a sort of environment where you're surrounded by brothers and sisters who are um, capable of of facing, you know, the the negative feedback that you're inevitably going to get for believing that the Bible is true, then there's a sense in which you certainly would personally need to be that way as well, right? Yeah, that's right. I think you need to have a that, and this is one of the things that Aaron Wren was addressing here recently. Um, are, you, are you guys familiar with Aaron and his work? Uh, I, I am. Yeah. yeah. So Aaron, I, uh, he wrote something that appeared at First Things here about a month ago, published on the, on the website. It had to do with the fact that we we now live in a world which he refers to as negative world, in which conflict is inevitable. It's just inevitable. No matter what you do, there's going to be conflict if you are a, a leader in the church. So just get used to it. And, and we, we need to start vetting candidates for the ministry on mental toughness. Can you take the pressure? You know, think about the Apostle Paul. The dude was mentally tough and physically tough. You know, you don't take that kind of physical punishment and and, and be a, you know, as a wimp. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> so this is a guy who could take it. Uh, it doesn't mean you go out looking for it, but it's, 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 a, it's just reality. You are going to face it. And so we need to start vetting candidates for the ministry, not on their likability, but <laughs> <laughs> which it seems to me what we do. Well, it's all dynamic uh, personality, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, it, it seems like we don't have... Uh, we don't want the kind of resume that Paul has. Like we don't That's want right. that kind of, I mean, That's beaten right. and shipwrecked. Yeah. And I mean, man, yeah. like you've, I mean, yeah, we, we don't want this guy as our pastor. He's a troublemaker. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he got people mad at him, you know? <laughs> That's right. That must yeah, mean I, that, I do he, think, I do think that in, in certain church environments, uh, it really is the unforgivable sin to, uh, to, to, to uh, kind of uh, precipitate conflict. In other words, not just simply to be the person who is, uh, receiving a pushback, but actually doing the pushing, sure. um, you know, that's, that's grounds. And I think some church environments were defrocking. <laughs> well, there, there is this strong and uh, powerful um, unspoken agreement in churches today that essentially I won't talk about your sin if you don't talk about mine. And <laughs> that's, right. that, that's kind of a part of it. Now, would you, um, I had a question. So you, um, you mentioned in terms of part of the cancel proof strategy is to essentially arrange your affairs financially in such a way that you're not, um, that you have some kind of security. And so you're thinking primarily in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things that the po- Proverbs are saying at that point, and then uh, surround yourself with uh, like-minded ministry leaders who have fortitude and toughness and uh, ability to handle conflict. Uh, would would that mean then you would discourage individuals from doing, um, to use one of those uh, trendy words, uh, church revitalization? Uh, meaning going into a church that's in trouble and trying to revitalize it? Yeah, going into a church that's an absolute mess theologically and trying to uh, turn the ship. Well, I think that that's probably the place where we, we need, you know, the tough-minded most. You know, that's uh, where you're likely to find uh, the need to maybe confront some situations. Now, in terms of when it comes to healing, I, you know, it's not like you, you keep the volume turned up all the time. <laughs> you know, there are certain situations where you, I think, you know, wisdom and discretion say, okay, I need to provide a little bit of space for grace right now. Uh, and that's where some, you know, kind of on the ground savvy is important. But I, I think in all of this, uh, probably, you know, I, I've dealt with some very practical kinds of matters and sort of strategies, but I think the most important thing is a kind of mindset and really uh, a kind of uh, confidence in God's care that allows you to, to cancel yourself first. So I think that's really where you, you have to begin. So the, the, the first step to becoming cancel proof is to cancel yourself. What I mean by that is that every, every person uh, has, uh, you know, aspires to maybe uh, develop in leadership and maybe uh, acquire greater, um, I guess, uh, status or maybe uh, uh, enjoy a, a wider sphere of ministry, that kind of stuff. And so a lot of times you'll have guys who have kind of career aspirations who, who, who uh, say, well, I can't, talk, I can't go there. I can't talk about that because there's this sort of nagging 
sort of a fear in the back of the mind that this may uh, limit my prospects down the road. Right. Sure. So I'm, I'm just going to try to manage this so that, uh, you know, I can kind of get out of this alive, <laughs> but I think uh, really what you need to do is just say, okay, I don't need the cool table. I don't need the, the other job. I'm just going to uh, accept the fact that I may be the most unpopular person in the room wherever I go for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm canceling myself right now. I'm just canceling myself. And there's a kind of freedom that uh, can follow when you do that. Now, of course, you know, this ought to be accompanied by a strong conviction that, that, you know, you're, you're, you're called to do this and that God is, uh, you know, going to care for you throughout all of this, even if it means, you know, living under a bridge in a cardboard box, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, uh, but I really do think you kind of have to think through these things, sort of worst case scenarios and say, okay, I can live with that. Is that it? So with the idea of canceling yourself, is that essentially um, the idea of ridding yourself from the fear of man? And um... Yeah, I think that's, 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 a, that's a way to put it. Yep. I think it, now with the fear of man, what we mean by that, it's not just that I'm afraid to make this guy unhappy. It can mean I'm afraid of what this may cost me with that group of people over there if they decide that I'm, per, I'm persona non grata now. So um, not caring about the 11th commandment. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think that, you know, there's the, I, I wrote something years ago entitled uh, how to be a happy pariah or a cheerful pariah. And I think that's the thing that you should strive for. What I mean by pariah is sort of like a, a person who's uh, you know, not uh, uh, maybe welcome in certain settings because uh, of the associations that are made. Um, so you're, you're like, ah, oh, here comes that guy. He always brings up that issue, you know, whatever. <laughs> Trouble. And, yeah. He always right. has something bad to say about me. <laughs> that, that or he just, yeah. He's, he's just, as always bringing up stuff about, I don't know, revoice or something, you know, some kind of sexual whatever, or, you know, and you know, if you can, if you can just say, okay, um, I can accept, uh, this pariah status and not revel in it or like get some kind of strange pleasure from it. But just uh, enjoy uh, the uh, sort of the adventure of being a minister of the gospel, <laughs> you know, and uh, just kind of kind of passing through all of this. I mean, you know, think about great pariahs in the past, um, Athanasius, uh, Christostom, uh, the Apostle Paul. <laughs> there, we've, we've, there are some pretty significant pariahs in the past who were often, uh, you know, unwelcome. Is part of that, uh, you know, developing that kind of mindset, then just having a commitment to the truth that supersedes basically um, everything else, a commitment to speak what's right and what's accurate? Um, yeah, I think that's right. There needs to be a measure of humility in the so far as, you know, none of us are the final word on anything. You know, there's there's always the, the potential that maybe there is some sort of dimension to the to the truth that we are not. Uh, you know, informed about, but so long as there's, there's that sense of, okay, I'm a vessel, I'm doing the best I can. And I may not be able to say everything that needs to be said, but this particular thing is definitely right. No matter what anybody says. Uh, and, and I'm going to stick to that. Then that's, that's what I'm getting at. Sure. Sure. Now what would be, um, what would be the difference between um, this kind of mindset that you're, encouraging individuals to strive towards and just being kind of pugnacious or, you know, basically just, um, developing, um, you know, developing a martyr complex or something along those lines where you just go into a situation like uh, example of, um, uh, you know, maybe you go into a Muslim country into the public square and just, uh, get ready to be beheaded kind of thing. Uh, would that, how would that relate? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things that I'm I'm hearing you say uh, there, Tim. That I think uh, kind of moves us in different directions. So, like a martyr complex, uh, you know, what can you know be going on uh, underneath the surface in a situation like that uh, is uh, some really bad theology, <laughs> sure. you know, um, uh, and also kind of a uh, a failure to recognize that there may be other alternatives <laughs> to pursue, you know, in, in your uh, desire to promote the, the truth. Sure. So, so 
Now, you may find yourself in the square someday, and you may find yourself in one of those either or situations where it's, you know, either deny Christ or die. And in those situations, then you die. Sure. Um, but I think that's one thing. But then with regard to sort of like a, a kind of a personality that kind of uh, delights in um, being provocative uh, giving, or yeah, giving offense, or maybe is trying to build some kind of following. And the way to do that is just by saying crazy things all the time, you know, and, and sort of getting the thrill <laughs> of uh, a lot of people kind of jumping on your bandwagon and, and uh, cheering you on. Um, you know, that I think that, you know, pride can be uh, a real pit, you know, pitfall for those folks. And, uh, and then the question is, what are you trying to build? You know, are you trying to just build your, your ego? Is this some kind of strange, um, you know, sort of uh, project that doesn't really have any real, you know, relationship to the truth. In other words, are you using the truth just simply to feed your ego needs uh, or are you actually out to promote the truth? Um, and I think that's an important, uh, important thing to consider when we talk about what, what we're saying here. So there's kind of two different things there that, that I, that came to mind with the sure. comments you made. Well, maybe, maybe I could just take it in a total, total uh, random direction, but maybe you could tell us what, uh, uh, you know, Trump did wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he certainly, you know, made himself into a cancel proof kind of person in a certain sense, but then, uh, right. uh, you know, h- how would, um, you know, the way that he went about, um, I mean, certainly whatever you say about him, he had a certain measure of courage and oh, it yeah. was significantly contagious, it seems to yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, but then there, you know, how would you distinguish just the Christian, um, yeah. What, version of that if there is such a thing well i i think that with trump you had a person and you know i didn't spend a tremendous amount of time analyzing that guy um there were things about him that that i found uh sort of refreshing like a lot of people you know kind of refreshing the uh, refreshment that you that you feel when you when you can say well finally somebody said it sure, <laughs> out in public sure. you know uh that kind of thing and then you know uh, the responses that people uh, you know uh, engaged in. I, my, my personal conviction is I, th- I thought about him a little bit is that he was he was fairly artful in a in a way and I mean in an, in a constructive way, in the sense that he would uh, he would distract you with some provocative statement and then while you are completely flipping out over that he's doing something over here that you're not watching. So he got a lot of things done because he was a real artist when it came to that. So um, I also think that because he had a kind of reputation for being brash, uh, he didn't need to prove anything on the battlefield, so to speak. Um, So, you know, when we look back upon his presidency, he's, I think, the first president in a long time that didn't get us into some war. Hmm. That's something that I think is lost in a lot of people because it seemed like Twitter was just a war zone all the time. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but it's, it's one thing to, to, to say something that people don't like to hear. It's another thing to blow up cities. And so he, 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 he seemed to, to, to work really hard at trying to keep us out of uh, actual bloody conflicts. But getting, I think, to the heart of what you're saying is what, what drove Trump? Well, I'm sure a lot of it's Trump in his ego, ego needs and that kind of stuff. I also kind of detected a, a kind of a pleasure uh, that he derived from, uh, irritating his, uh, his adversaries. And I think that some of that goes back a long way to, uh, his days in New York and certain, uh, communities that he was, uh, kind of blackballed, uh, and kept out of, uh, because of his kind of gruff Queens, uh, kind of manner and approach to things. Um, Anyway, those are some speculations. Now, what, how does this relate to, to people in the church? Well, I think there are some people who are um, are tempted in different ways. You know, I, I've I've crit- criticized people who were, uh, you know, tempted tempted to cowardice in the name of uh, you know some kind of misunderstanding of what the of, of the piece of the church means. So they're avoiding conflict all the time. Sure. Um, but I think that there's a there's a problem on the other end of the spectrum where a person can just find the thrill of the kind of the the pugnacious, uh, you know, sort of uh, struggle in the public square uh, to be almost intoxicating and it's a source of pleasure. 
And yeah. uh, if that's the case, then, you know, you're not, you're not keeping things in proper perspective. You're, you're, you're doing, you're doing something that doesn't serve the interests of the gospel. Talking about uh, the, those in the church who are typically more wary of, of getting themselves into any kind of uh, conflict or negative pushback for things. It, it seems like a big problem in the evangelical church right now um, is this idea that uh, we need to be, uh, you know, like you hear the SBC, for example, uh, their, their big mantra over the, over the last few years has been the world is watching. Right. And, and you hear words like uh, winsome being thrown around all the time where we need to try to win the world over for Christ. And so uh, it seems like you end up because of, of, of um, these, uh, these kinds of ideas are, are the result of people who typically view any sort of, you know, negative press or, or pushback from, um, from the unbelieving world. They view that as a, as a really bad thing and maybe almost even um, unfaithful uh, uh, to Christ when we experience those things. And so how do you think uh, that that issue has come about and become so popular in the evangelical church? I think it has something to do with a kind of march, a marketing strategy that uh, was adopted uh, in the name of evangelism. So we, with the rise of the, of, you know, sort of the, the church growth movement in the late seventies and, and mid eighties and how that would kind of led to um, the seeker sensitive phenomenon in the nineties. Uh, what we ended up creating is this ethos in which we're trying to create a public image uh, that can be readily uh, kind of uh, well, uh, seen as benign, you know, it's, you know, the, these are all just really good people over there and that kind of thing. And they don't do anything that makes anybody uncomfortable. Um, I think that, uh, that is, that is uh, not in keeping with what we see in the new Testament. <laughs> it seems yeah, like in the new, yeah. new Testament, what we have is the, is the message leads and that message is good news, but it also has some rather demanding, uh, implications for those who uh, hear it. Obviously, it means, uh, you know, that uh, uh, there's a call to repentance. It means that there's some appropriate response in faith, giving ourselves uh, uh, in faith to God because he's given uh, his son to us uh, as a sacrifice for our sins. All of that uh, can be deeply offensive. And then to say Jesus is Lord was a political statement. It wasn't just uh, he's Lord in my heart or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's Lord in fact, uh, and Caesar is not. And so that uh, challenged people and uh, offended them. And so I think that if we, what we need is re to recover our apostolic confidence. Uh, that, that what I mean by apostolic confidence is that we know something the world doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just simply is the case. So let's, let's take a look at the new, the rise of the new left in the, in the, in the uh, uh, early seventies and how it's successfully kind of marched through the institutions. Let me tell you something. They didn't give one, they didn't give one thought to being winsome. Hmm. They cared about winning. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference. They did the things they needed to do to win. And if they hurt your feelings along the way, too bad for you. That's uh, something that I think that uh, I'm not advocating a complete, you know, sort of embrace of uh, everything Saul Alinsky said or anything crazy like that. They had a plan at least, right? They had a plan and, and, and the message was the thing that led, uh, not the, uh, whether or not people liked what they heard. Well, isn't that what's so funny about it is that, that the left is on a mission and then even our, you know, soft evangelical leaders, uh, it's, it seems like um, these, there's an asymmetrical standard in how these things are being applied. And so when it comes to any kind of push uh, like with the left, the left is obviously treated with kid gloves and then you punch right. And that's the way it works. Yeah. yeah and, and what kind of friends do we have in the evangelical elite? 
if they that's kind the of throw us to the wolves. Is what we had friends they, with. They, they do. They do it all the time. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. what I think is we shouldn't just we sh first of all, we should not get our hopes about, you know, up about those folks at all. Uh, and we need to just simply say, OK, uh, we're going to need to take care of some of these matters on our own without your help and just push forward. And I've been in environments many times, many times where uh, someone who was, say, you know, uh, kind of a spokesperson for the new left, uh, kind of what we might call woke or whatever, didn't give one thought to my feelings. Put the finger in my face accused me of wrong and gave me no quarter at all. Not even uh, a means by which I was supposed to like redeem myself. If you defend I, yourself, it's just evidence against you, right? Yeah, pretty much. I was just supposed to stop existing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's it. So if that's the way the game is played, well, we don't play by the, all those rules, but I think we need to, to, to sort of, uh, Find a way of accept or to accept that we're not going to win those people over with these winsome sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, philo these philosophies of, whims of winsomeness. Mm -hmm. that get they, they're not working. I mean, at least we should be able to say that they're not working. Yeah. Yeah. Pragmatism isn't going to win the day over, I guess. Huh? Yeah. All right. Well, I guess uh, maybe we'll just ask a few more questions. I know you have to go. I'll just I'll just ask one more. Maybe Harrison will get one more, and then we'll. Um, thank you for your time. But yeah, um, Tim, glad to do it. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I know with uh, so, so essentially what you have on on in mainstream, I guess, reform evangelicalism, you have a lot of individuals who are uh, pushing the winsome, nuanced. Uh, uh, gentle Jesus, that, that that sort of thing at every point. And then I think with the guys who are basically aware of how this game works, uh, w th there's this uh, realization that there's a lot of hard words that are to be found in scripture. So, you know, John the Baptist or Jesus, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from wrath to come. I mean, essentially you have Jesus, you know, Sermon on the Mount, uh, making a polemic against the Pharisees and at different points in his ministries, you know, you have the lawyer who comes up to him and says, Hey, if you, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're right. saying these harsh words to the Pharisees, that also implicates us. He, and then that doesn't deter him. He goes right into the lawyers too. And so uh, there's right. some, uh, some place uh, it seems in the Bible for uh, this um, war mentality where you are waging sure. war. We're not uh, battling according to the flesh, but you know, everything else. And so th there's that kind of thing. And I, and I think I hear like when I hear the, um, essentially, um, the guys who are up on the game, uh, on, on, in the circles that, uh, I would say you run in and I listen to, um, there's, there might be a kind of dismissal to the notion of gentleness at all, or meekness at all, or winsomeness at all. Is there any way to, Harmonize those two kinds of passages, you know, the kind of passage with Second Timothy two twenty four, Lord, Lord servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently endure an evil, with the brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. How do we do both at the same time? Well, the old time preachers would talk about afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. Sure, <laughs> I think that's a that's a good way to kind of think about this. Um, and I think that sometimes, uh, you know, we look at people that we might think of as kind of bombastic or, or kind of a uh, little too, I guess, uh, you know, prone to pugilism. Sure. Uh, and we only see them in the clip. We right. don't see the rest of their lives. We don't, we're not aware of what else is going on. Um, I know some of these guys, and I know that uh, in many other facets of their lives, there is kind of humble and meek as you could possibly want. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, how, how, do the, how does it get out, you know, that they're that way? Well, they don't have PR departments that spend sure. all their time following around and trying to make them look good. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> they just kind of, you know, we only see them in the, in the crisis moment or the conflict moment. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, well, when we you're in the battle, it doesn't look very pretty, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, it, when you walk into a situation, uh, you you may find yourself sympathetic to the wrong party just because you kind of walked in at a particular moment where that that that's the person who seems to be getting beaten up. 
you just you, you just missed the earlier you know you know sort of episode where the guy pulled out a gun <laughs> right right <laughs> and was trying to kill that other guy well isn't that what's funny about it too that uh with a lot of the those kind of situations that you're describing it, it, i think and you're talking about people who are sheltered from the harsh realities of the world in certain ways that uh, there there are certain situations you might find yourself in like that kind of situation that is like it's never going to look pretty to restrain a adult man with man strength who doesn't want to be restrained, that kind of thing. Right. Right. So I, I think that um, we need to be, I guess, uh, prudent in, in the judgments that we make about a, a particular situation. But, you know, I think to, to the heart of what you're asking, Tim, I think uh, uh, the audience to whom we are, you know, to perform our ministry is the, you know, uh, you know, the, the Christ who's seated at the right hand. He's the one that we're, most should be most conscious of with regard to our, the, the conduct of our lives. Uh, there are going to be plenty of, uh, you know, there are going to be plenty of, t- plenty of times in our lives where we're misunderstood. Sure. And it doesn't matter how much we work to try to make ourselves look good. Uh, it's just not going to look good for in the eyes of some people. Would th- so would I think, be a- Go ahead and continue. No, well, I, I think you know where I was going. It's, you know, keeping our eyes focused on the one to whom we're accountable. So would, would you say uh, just rejecting kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to every encounter would be part of what you're saying then in terms of afflicting the – how did you put that? Afflicting the uh, yeah, comforting the Yeah, comforting, yeah, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Yeah. And um, sometimes um, – well, I, I think I've said I think I've said what I what I intended to say concerning how that may look to outsiders um, or to people who are not familiar with the situation on the ground and have seen it, you know, sure. over a span of time. Okay. Well, um, I guess the last question that we'll ask you in closing is is you know a lot of the people that listen to our podcast are they're going to be the kind of people who are holding a very unpopular worldview in today's day and age. Um, so, so be yourself being someone who has faced a lot of, you know, um, negative pushback, who is, you know, all the way up to death threats. Uh, what would you say as an encouragement to the person who feels like, Hey, I've got, I've got all of these things that I, I'm looking at the Bible. I'm reading what it says. I totally, I trust that God is not lying to me. I trust that when he says something is good, he means it's good, no matter what the world says. But then the problem is everyone I know around me, um, they don't agree. And normally they're very vocal about their disagreement with me uh, in a way that I don't always feel like I can necessarily be as vocal in my disagreement as they are. So what would you say as an encouragement to that kind of person um, uh, who's facing a lot of opposition uh, because of of their belief uh, and what God has revealed to us, yeah, I think the thing that I turn to is that reality always wins. So you know, we live in a world that um, is ordered the way it is because of the Creator, and that Creator uh, governs it on an ongoing basis. And when uh, God argues. Uh, it's not just a verbal exchange. Um, when God argues, things happen. In other words, there's judgment and things uh, are shaken that can be shaken and things that can't be shaken remain. So we may, you know, we're at a particular point in history where we see uh, a lot of uh, things that are, are concerning but they really don't have a future. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if we were just to kind of think about them dispassionately and just pondered, how can these things possibly uh, carry forward over the generations? How can these things generally, or even be reconciled to any kind of healthy development of a culture? They can't be. So, you know, we're thinking, you know, when we think about the, the nuttiness with regard to marriage or sexual ethics and that kind of thing in our society, we're, 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 we're in a situation where uh, there's no way we can actually reconcile the nuttiness that we see around us with the kind of health that I think we know uh, is, is required in order for our culture to, to, you know, move forward in a, in a good way. So what I'm getting at is, is that 
the consequences of the actions that people are, are engaged in. Uh, and also just, you know, the fact that God uh, is uh, sovereign and is overseeing uh, the course of human history, uh, there will be correctives. So we can warn and uh, we can pray, uh, but we don't necessarily need to uh, think that it's all up to us to make everything change, you know, in, mm -hmm. in a way that we think it should change or are or, or convinced it has to change. Uh, sometimes we kind of just kind of watch and wait and things uh, uh, occur that people can't argue again, you know, with, they're just realities. So let me give you an example. Uh, we live in a world where uh, fewer women are having children. Yeah. Give it 20 years. You know, if you go around today and ask a lot of these gals why they are, you know, you know, living the way that they're living, that they'll you'll you'll find a range of uh, justifications. Everything from you know, I I want to reduce my carbon footprint to um, uh, you know, we need fewer white people in the world or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and 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 that's what they say today. But when they're all alone and they're and they're pushing 50 and the prospects for having children are completely gone. Uh, and, you know, uh, they just maybe not even any realistic situation to even uh, adopt children. And if they even were to adopt children, they would be in for a big surprise in terms of how difficult it can be to raise an adopted child. Um, I think you'll find that a lot of these gals have some pretty significant regrets and we might uh, I think uh, be well served to think about how are we going to minister 20 years from now to all these disillusioned and bitter women mm -hmm. rather than spend all of our time today thinking about how can we tell them, Oh, it's okay. You don't need to get married. You know, maybe we need to think about um, where this all leads. We need a longer timeline. Yeah. I think something Doug uh, frequently says, and I don't, I don't know exactly the way he says it, but um something along the lines of crazy never works uh, long term. Yeah. But, um, yeah, right. I think that's right. But um, it does make you want to go hug your wife and your kids uh, thinking yeah. about some of those things and just uh, be moved to more compassion for those who are caught up in these kind of delusions for sure. Because, I mean, it is a bleak, uh, yeah. you know, it's a bleak future that they don't understand. Really. Yeah. And then oftentimes there are other kinds of painful episodes in their lives that, you know, contributed to the embrace uh, that they've, uh, you know, made with some of this craziness. So, you know, I'm with you. I mean, I, my kids are grown. I've got a couple of granddaughters now. Uh, my wife and I have a great marriage, We've got great, our, all of our kids are believers. Um, I'm in a very good spot. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm living the dream. You yeah. Can say. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have any, it's not like I'm mad at anybody because they've kept something from me. I'm more just kind of like exasperated that, uh, you know, people can't see just how good uh, it is when you do things the right way. Yeah, sure. Well, well, Chris, you've answered all our questions. We're really thankful um, <laughs> that you've come on. It's, it's been great talking to you. Tell us, uh, where can people go uh, to find more of you? Well, I mean, uh, I've got a website, crwiley.com, and go there. I don't spend a lot of time there. It's just basically a bulletin board. Say so I just published a book <laughs> and every once in a while I, I put up some interview that, uh, you know, I, I, uh, was, uh, involved in. Um, but then there's a the theology podcast, which go, comes out every week. We've got about 10,000 listeners worldwide. This just blows our mind. Um, so we did a show on Ukraine and, uh, Russia here recently. And so just, you know, because the, a podcasting software allows us to kind of explore where our listeners are. I discovered that we do have listeners in Russia in three different cities and in Ukraine in four different cities. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's pretty wild <laughs> that, uh, that that's the case, but uh, that, that that's the, that's, you know, you see it there. And then of course there are the books. And if you ever find yourself here in, you know, the Pacific Northwest uh, come by and say, hello, I'm at the uh, Westminster Presbyterian church in Vancouver. 
Yeah, I wish we would have uh, interviewed you on Tom Bombadil uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a fun book to do. <laughs> All right. Well, Chris, we wanted to thank you again um, for coming on the show. We we really appreciate it a lot, and uh, we want to thank. Also, our listeners out there um, for taking the time to listen to our conversation. And hopefully it's been helpful for you guys. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. This has been another episode of Bible Bashed. We hope you have been encouraged and blessed through our discussion. We thank you for all your support and ask you to continue to like and subscribe to Bible Bashed and share our podcast with your friends and on social media. Please reach out to us with your questions, pushback, and potential topics for us to discuss in future episodes at BibleBashedPodcast at gmail.com and consider supporting us through Patreon. If you would like to be Bible Bashed personally, then please know that we also offer free biblical counseling, which you can take advantage of by emailing us. Now, go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move.